This video is sponsored by Paradox Interactive. Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at Stellaris and the many years of DLC it's received since its release back in 2016. Stellaris was actually the first game I covered on the channel, so it's always had a special place in my heart, and the DLC through the years has completely changed the game alongside the periodic free updates. There is a huge sale on Stellaris right now, and you can check it out at the link in the description and pinned comment down below, but if you're not sure which DLC to pick up, this should give you some idea of what you may or may not want, whether it's on sale or not. With no time to waste, and in chronological order, let's dive in. The first DLC that dropped for Stellaris was the Plantoid Species Pack, and it used to be a relatively minimal DLC as far as added content is concerned. When it first released, it was purely a set of new skins, new aesthetics for your species itself, as well as new visual options for their ships and cities and stations, etc, etc. As of the 3.1 update of September 2021, the Plantoids DLC has been made a little more interesting thanks to some new options for civics and species traits being added in retroactively. Two of the three new traits will change the upkeep costs of your populations, with one of them making tomb worlds more attractive options for colonization, and the final new trait allows for some pop assembly through budding. Of the two new civics being added, one is available to all regular empires, hive minds, and machine empires to turn food into alloys, while the other new civic is exclusive to certain types of plantoid and fungoid empires, allowing them to build Gaia Seeders that terraform planets into Gaia worlds over four phases. These are pretty neat retrofits, not gonna lie, but even with them, the plantoid species pack remains very narrow in its scope. It's something you'll hear often about species packs throughout this video. It's certainly a more worthwhile DLC now after these new additions, but you can hold off on it until you're ready to play as a, I don't know, shiitake mushroom or something. There's certainly no rush to pick this one up, though again, it does add some pretty fun portraits. The next DLC to drop for Stellaris was the Leviathan's Story Pack, and I'd consider this the first of a few must-haves since it has an impact across all possible playthroughs, adding some great layers of gameplay. Enclaves are traders, curators, and artisans with stations of their own that you can either take by force or interact with diplomatically. They bring with them a plethora of events and options, from becoming a patron of the arts to gaining extra damage against specific guardians, the extremely powerful space-born leviathan aliens that were also introduced with this DLC. Between the terrifying asteroid hives, automated dreadnoughts, star-eating monstrosities, and some guardians that actually aren't hostile but instead give an opportunity for research and narrative event chains, these are a great new challenge and sets of storylines that have been added to the base game, with later DLCs actually adding even more varieties. The War in Heaven is the last major addition with Leviathans as a sort of mid to late game situation you can find yourself needing to deal with, where two ancient fallen empires might awaken at once and decide to resume an age-old rivalry with you sitting in the middle either picking a side or simply trying to survive on your own or alongside others who decide to remain non-aligned. All in all, Leviathans adds plenty to Solaris and is an easy purchasing decision whether on sale or at full price. It's got a very broad scope and it'll impact every playthrough no matter your empire type, your species, or any other bits of customization you have in mind. Up next was Utopia, and boy, this is a DLC that lives up to its name and is quite possibly the best piece of DLC Stellaris has ever received. Some of the additions it makes to the game are so integral to the experience now that I cannot imagine, let alone remember, ever playing without it. This is an absolute must-have. Right off the bat, the ability to build megastructures is just awesome. You can build Dyson Spheres, Ring Worlds, Science Nexuses, and more, and though they take time, preparation, and effort, the end result and the journey through the process is undeniably epic. Habitats were another new addition, and though they later became available to a specific Empire type from a later DLC, you do need Utopia to build them otherwise. Habitats are basically artificial planets on which your species can live, and they come with their own unique districts and challenges as well. Ascension perks are unlocked by completing tradition trees, and they give unique modifiers to your empire, and though most ascension perks have been folded into the base game and some have been added through later DLC, ascension paths are three options that are still unique to this DLC that you get around the mid-game that help you determine how the latter half of a game of Stellaris might go. Between biological ascension, psionic ascension, and synthetic ascension, you have a couple of options for your people. 
From genetic modification to psionic powers to cybernetic upgrades, these are great not just mechanically, but also from a role-playing and flavor perspective, something I'm personally quite partial to. On which topic, a plethora of options are opened up right at the start as well. This DLC adds the Hive Mind Empire type to the game, bringing with it a unique set of civics to choose from, like the Devouring Swarm that lets you consume anything biological that isn't the swarm itself. Utopia also brings with it the positively dystopian sounding Fanatic Purifier Civic that allows you to focus on purging the universe of every other species right from the start. There's even more to this DLC, but these are the heavy hitters that I think makes this well worth buying without a moment's hesitation. A bit of a gold standard for DLC, even after some of its aspects were folded into the base game, do not skip out on Utopia. Synthetic Dawn came next and sits sort of in the middle of the pack. It adds quite a few features, but in many ways has a narrower scope, especially when considering it right after Utopia. If the name doesn't give it away, Synthetic Dawn is all about robots, allowing for machine empires that are similar to hive minds but with a few tweaks like not needing food, for example, or like having access to machine intelligence civics that give their own unique buffs and modifiers. Playing as exterminators, assimilators, or servitors can be fun, and you might also see AI rebellions within your own non-robotic empire if the conditions are right, and they are very difficult conditions to sort of make happen. You will also see machine fallen empires to contend with as well. Naturally, all this comes with appropriate art added to the game as well, whether that be audio or visual in nature. And all in all, like I said, there are some fun new bits to play with if you have Synthetic Dawn, but you'll only really get the most out of it if you intend to play as a robot faction. They can definitely be fun to play, especially if you're into role-playing and have an inclination towards robot supremacy, and I've certainly had a good time playing as machine intelligences and the unique events and art and writing is all top-notch, but if you're not looking to play as robots, you really can hold off on picking this one up until later. The Humanoid Species Pack is, like the Plantoid Species Pack, by no means a necessary purchase. It adds some more portraits and city aesthetics alongside a new ship set, and the 3.1 Lem update will add some new elements to the DLC as well, namely the Masterful Crafters Civic that helps produce trade value and engineering research alongside consumer goods from the Artificers, who replace the Artisan job type, and Pleasure Seekers that opens up the decadent lifestyle living standard alongside better growth rate through entertainers and amenity production from servants. This definitely opens up the option to make things like pleasure planets, but apart from that, it's really nothing too special. The biggest addition is the clone army origin that prevents your species from reproducing naturally, instead needing to rely on ancient cloning vats for organic pop assembly. It sounds like there are some stories to explore with this new origin as well, but as you can tell, compared to the other DLC out there, Humanoids can be almost entirely skipped, and is probably the weakest of the Stellaris DLC in both its scope and scale, even with the 3.1 updates and changes. Apocalypse was up next, and purely anecdotally, Apocalypse was a DLC that drew me right back into the extended arms of Stellaris for its warm embrace. Massive Titan-class ships are an impressive sight themselves, outclassing battleships with ease and giving you a higher tier of devastation to aim for, but of course, that isn't enough. With Apocalypse comes the Colossus Project and the option to build some of the most entertaining and awe-inspiring ships available in the game. World Crackers do what it says on the tin can, cracking worlds open, wiping out all life on them. The Neutron Sweep can wipe out the population of a planet while keeping the planet itself intact. Nanobots can be launched to assimilate populations into your consciousness, and that's only a few of the options, there's quite a few more. Beyond that, Marauders are a neutral empire type that were added, occasionally going out to threaten and raid empires or offering their services as mercenaries. There's a new mid-game crisis in the Great Khan as well, where one of these Marauder empires gets really into it and decides they're going to take over the galaxy. I've had so much fun with the content in the Apocalypse DLC, especially when playing with friends, there's really nothing quite like cracking a friend's planet wide open or scrambling to protect one of your own from the same fate. The arms race to titans or the luck of happening across one in the void of space are all exciting prospects, and since warfare features in pretty much every game of Stellaris, Apocalypse is great to flesh out those aspects. I think it could maybe use a bit more to justify its price tag, but at the same time, I've enjoyed it quite thoroughly and I don't regret having paid full price for it back in the day. I would 
definitely recommend picking up Apocalypse, especially on sale, but even at full price. With Distant Stars, you'll get another extremely chunky piece of DLC with a broad scope of changes that make it near essential to the gameplay experience. Especially after it got an upgrade in September of 2018, there are so many new events, anomalies, and unique planets and systems to come across. There's new Leviathan types like the Corrupted Avatar, Tianki Matriarch, the Void Spawn, the Scavenger Bot. There's a Curator Enclave that comes with this DLC as well if you don't already have them through the Leviathan's DLC. This DLC also brings with it the Elgate related events and storylines that bring some very interesting twists and turns to a game of Stellaris right around the uh, mid-game usually. Honestly, there isn't too much to say or outline about this DLC. It doesn't have, you know, 20 bullet points to talk about, so to speak, but what few points it does focus on, it goes in deep, and I'd say it's well worth the price of admission. The Megacorp DLC is an interesting one to make a call on. It uh, adds quite a bit, but I wouldn't say it's necessary to have in your early days of playing Stellaris. There are some newly added mega structures like the Interstellar Assembly and Matter Decompressor and a few more, and there's a whole new government type to play as as well. Putting the Corp in Megacorp is the corporate authority option that can mean anything from a crime syndicate to a mega church to a trade league and more. The corporate civic options are locked behind this corporate authority, of course, and there are certainly some fun options among them. Criminal heritage as you increase crime through buildings, naval contractors helps you have a larger fleet, and there are more grounded options too, like the corporate death cult that are willing to sacrifice people for profits, though you do need a separate DLC for this one. Playing as a corporate empire adds options like establishing branch offices in other empires' planets, allowing you to reap benefits outside your own planets, and though there are hurdles you need to jump to be able to do this, it's a fun concept. I think I personally have a big draw to this DLC because of this subject matter. I like this kind of gameplay, call it alternative conquest if you will, the opportunity to play tall but not necessarily rely on vassals and allies in the traditional sense. If that sounds interesting to you, I'd say there's enough meat in that aspect of this DLC alone to make it worthwhile. But if you're not sure if that's your speed, you can pick this one up later. It adds a few other things, mind you. The aforementioned new mega structures come with some new ascension perks. The slave market, the caravaneers who travel about and offer you deals and sometimes steal from you. It also comes with the option to turn planets into ecumenopoli, if I'm saying that correctly. Think Coruscant, massive planet-wide cities that look super cool and have benefits suited to that kind of density. Is all that worth the price tag if you don't intend to also play as a corporate empire right away? Ah, eh, maybe on sale? If you are interested in trying out a very different approach to empire building though, this one definitely opens up some fun options in my books. Ancient Relics came next with another set of wide-reaching changes, primarily introducing archaeology and the titular relics. Not only does this add even more layers to the exploration aspects of Stellaris, but it adds to what you can do with your findings after the fact. Archaeology itself is a little lackluster, funnily enough, since it's a little plain and linear in its execution but the idea is certainly cool. There are cool new precursors, but the standout addition has to be the relics themselves that can affect victory score and also apply various buffs. Then there's also the minor artifacts that you can collect and use for various purposes, putting one on display, making a quick buck, etc, etc. It's a weird one, ancient relics. On the one hand, I like the added options, but on the other, does it really add enough, especially with the dig sites being as they are? I feel like this is an easy purchase on sale rather than a must-have, despite its broad approach, so you can kind of hold off on this one. I'd like to say the Lithoids DLC rocks, but as a species pack, you're about to hear what you've heard a couple times already. Unless you want to play as this specific subset of species with their unique portraits and ship designs and mechanics, there's no reason to get this DLC. Lithoids do have a unique origin option, which give you a crater on your homeworld and the option to lob meteors at other planets to colonize them while causing a touch of damage, and their species mechanics are, well, they're different. You don't need food, you eat minerals instead, and you can produce some byproducts yourself. It's fun stuff, and it's good fluff and world building, but is it necessary for a first or even a fifth or a tenth playthrough? Nah, there's plenty else to do first, though I will say some of these portraits are really visually striking. At the end of the day, unless you're looking to play as a species inspired by Dwayne Johnson, you can skip this DLC until you're ready to do so. Worth a go, but really no reason to rush it. 
The Federation's DLC adds a few interesting mechanics that really switch things up across the board. Again, a wide-reaching DLC that affects you no matter who you play is always more appealing than something narrow in scope, and this one focuses around certain diplomatic elements, though it does go beyond that as well. For one, there are the titular federations. This DLC adds a variety of types of federations you can form with other empires, from trade leagues to martial alliances to research cooperatives and more. And there's a layer of customization and leveling and objectives that you can pursue that you can't do with the base game alone. It's a lot of fun forming federations, especially when playing with friends. Seeing power blocks form and dealing with internal politics, there's a lot of meat to it. And though the base game does include some basic federation mechanics, the DLC really fills them out. Then there are the additional resolutions for the galactic community to vote on, passing or repealing laws and determining what's okay to do and what's not. Beyond that is the creatively named Mega Shipyard Megastructure and the Juggernaut ship class to make your fleets even more unstoppable. It's beefier than a Titan and it can build, repair, and upgrade ships on the fly. One of the biggest selling points of this DLC has to be the seven origins it unlocks. One has you starting as the vassal of a fallen empire. Another has you starting on a shattered ring world that you can try to repair. Another has you living in habitats with a preference for said artificial living spaces and penalties for living on planets. One gives you a mysterious benefactor that's left behind a dig site for you while one sees your homeworld explode within 35 to 45 years. These and more options really spruce up your storyline and playthrough right from the start. And even if you don't want one of these specific origins, all the other features come together to make for a very fun set of additions to the base game. Again, whether you're a pacifist or a warmonger, there's something fun for everyone. I can highly recommend this one. Next up, Necroids. Another species pack, so you might already know where this is going. Necroids adds a new origin option, as well as new portraits and ship designs and rooms, etc., etc., alongside three new civics, death cults, reanimated armies, and memorialists. It also ties in with the Megacorp DLC to give you corporate death cults, but apart from that, you can't see me, but I'm kind of shrugging right now. <laughs> the 3.1 update is bringing some new elements to this DLC for free. Uh, you can now make hive mind necrophage empires, complete with fittingly adjusted writing and mechanics, though nothing major. And there are some tweaks across the board besides as well. These tweaks are largely balance adjustments to make sure the mechanics from this DLC didn't fall behind as a result of updates to the game, so nothing new per se, though an empire with reanimated undead armies now can revive the Voidspawn or Tianki Matriarch Leviathans to fight for them, so that's pretty cool. The art and origin and civics are all neat enough, Space Necromancer certainly has a ring to it, but again, as with all species packs, there is absolutely no rush to pick this one up unless its very specific features call to you. There's so much other stuff to do before you need to pick this one up. And finally, we have the Nemesis DLC. I really had a lot of fun with this one as it introduces some new endgame mechanics, namely you. Becoming the Crisis in particular can be a joyride, and you can get to Crisis status pretty quickly if you're focused on unity, using your traditions and ascension perks, unlocking more and more powerful options, allowing you to terrorize other empires, and otherwise gain access to mechanics that might otherwise be locked behind certain technologies. You can eventually explode entire suns, or bring about a galactic apocalypse, whatever floats your boat. On the flip side, you can be the galactic custodian, empowered by the galaxy to do what's needed to protect it from the crisis, though when said crisis is solved and there's no more emergency, you don't necessarily have to surrender your newfound powers either. These two elements alone make Nemesis a very fun DLC, but the addition of espionage mechanics are just little cherries on top. They don't do all that much. As a big fan of espionage and subterfuge, I wish they did a lot more, but they do add a little bit of flavor. Now, while I enjoy rushing to become the Crisis by the mid-game and then having an absolute romp destroying the galaxy, if you want to play a more regularly paced game, you have to ask yourself how often you might actually get to the end game. For many, Stellaris is a game where each playthrough lasts until you accomplish some short-term self-imposed objective or another, not necessarily playing all the way to the endgame crisis or anything. Are you looking for shorter runs or longer ones? If the former, you might not see some of the stuff this DLC brings. If the latter, you almost certainly will. As fun as Nemesis is, 
I would say there's no rush to get it, really. There are countless other DLCs to pick up first, and once you have some of the must-haves, you can then consider adding Nemesis to your collection. Maybe wait until, like, summer sale of next year or something like that. It's a fun DLC, but like I was saying, there's so many others I've listed in this video that are absolute must-haves. You know, right when you buy Stellaris, you should pick those DLCs up to make sure you have a full first experience. So Nemesis can kind of wait. But there you have it. Five years of support from Paradox, 13 pieces of DLC, and hopefully a helpful guide to help you pick and choose what works best for your needs and wants. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the DLC that Stellaris has received over the years. Any that you picked up and would highly recommend for others? Any of my assessments that you particularly agree or disagree with? I'm always curious to know what people think and why, so go ahead and drop a comment down below. For more strategy gaming coverage, including reviews, previews, let's plays, and more, don't hesitate to subscribe to the channel. And as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.